Hello, I'm Barry Daniel and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated ethical life, avoiding dogma or any absolute appeal to authority. Our guest today is Marianne Wolf. Marianne is the John Diabaggio Professor of Citizenship and Public Service and Director of the Centre for Reading and Language Research. She is an expert on the neurological underpinnings of reading, language and dyslexia. She is also the author of numerous scientific publications as well as two books written for the general public, Proust and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain, which has been translated into 10 languages, and her latest book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. And this will be the topic of our discussion today. Well, hello, Marianne. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Yeah, what a pleasure, Mary. I look forward to this. OK, well, perhaps uh, could you begin by telling us a bit about your background and how you got involved in this field of work? Um, it's a rather circuitous story that begins with two degrees in English literature. I always thought that my life would be studying and giving others reasons to study poetry, especially the poetry of Rainer Maria Rilke. Right. And um, after I completed a, a master's in English literature with a, with, with a special, if you will, um, area on Rilke, I went of all places in a Peace Corps-like experience uh, teaching in rural Hawaii um, in a plantation. Wow. And it was there that the, there were 10 languages. The school had been abandoned by everyone. And so all of us who were in this, it was like a Peace Corps, but not quite. But we were, we were confronted with the reality of people who would never, ever meet their potential because they had never learned to read. And so our job was to educate their children. Um, but the reality was that day and night we were confronted with the reality of what the lack of literacy means to a person's development. Mm -hmm. And so what happened to me was that I realized I cannot, um, if you will, have the luxury of studying Rilke um, during the day, but rather I would figure out here, you know, the young idealistic person, I would figure out what goes into literacy and how I could change it. And so I went to the Harvard Reading Lab uh, for a, um, my doctorate in which I realized that for me to understand reading and to understand literacy, I had to understand how it developed in the brain. And that began a lifelong study of oral and written language and how the brain ever develops what is an unnatural circuit. And so my work became, um, it, it, it was honed in on what can we do to help children who are either failing or unable to develop reading for physiological reasons, neurological reasons, and that began the study of dyslexia. And from that point on, dyslexia made me aware of what it takes to read, what happens when you can't read, how can you intervene, how can you understand how to help all children learn to read by understanding what dyslexia is and how to get children with dyslexia to learn to read. So what began as a, a way of, trying to figure out how to make all children literate. That was when I was in my 20s. <laughs> it became a lifelong study of the absolute beauty of the reading brain, how in the world we can teach it. And then, uh, as of 2007, it began to be obvious to me that the world does not share this complexity, this understanding of the complexity of reading and my God, we're losing it. And that's when I became, I wrote the book Proust and the Squid, the story and science of the reading brain. And that changed everything because I had to confront not my love of reading and wanting to share it and the knowledge, but my premonition in 2007 that everything was changing under our fingertips. 
And that began the next 10 years in which I really began um, uh, a single-minded study of what does digital, what does the digital world do to us in terms of reading? But for me, reading was and is a petri dish for our best thoughts. And the idea that that petri dish was losing, losing so much of what went into it because we were beginning to skim not just reading, but skim the world, if you will. I then decided to write two books. Well, the first was for Oxford Literary Agenda, a book called Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century. Um, it was an academic book and not a book for everyone. But Harper Collins, my publisher for Proust, said, can you write a book that is accessible to all? And that's when I returned Barry to Rilke. And Rilke's book, Letters to the Young Poet, had always been a kind of a, a boon companion to me through the years. I reread it and thought, it's not the lyricism. It's not the beauty of the craft of writing that is so impressive to me this moment as an adult, but rather the tenderness, the willingness to be open and to give one's best wisdom to someone you'll never meet through a letter. And that's when I decided it's going to be a series of letters that will not suggest that I know everything about this topic, but rather that it is time for the author and the reader of this particular book to be almost like a microcosm of us speaking to our world. And so I look at the letter as a dialogue between myself and the reader. Rilke is the tender aspect in which I hope that there's no sense of me wanting to impose my knowledge, but rather to have an active mind interacting with my mind and having two bodies of knowledge and experience coming together and say, who are we this moment? Who will we become if we are not aware of the atrophying of the reading brain circuit as we know it? Who do we want to become? So in a way, Barry, I, I liken this to Kant's three questions. What do we know? What can we do? What do we hope for? And so those three co questions motivated this book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. And that's my story. <laughs> Brilliant. As a reader of the book, it, it certainly did feel like a kind of conversation. And also there were some really profound thoughts in there, but they were very digestible. So in that sense, I would highly recommend it as a a book to the, you know, for the general public as well. It was great. So um, I'm going to ask you an Im uh, almost impossible question now, uh, basically <laughs> to give us a perhaps a, an uh, overview of the book, just to give listeners a, a sort of snapshot, an idea of what the book involves. Okay. So impossible question, impossible response. <laughs> <laughs> Here it begins. Uh, we'll not call it impossible. We'll call it the imperfect response by an imperfect author. I hope to make the reader understand and appreciate how beautiful it is that we as a species developed a reading brain circuit when there was nothing there. But in order to do that, I decided I wanted to make it, in Italo Calvino's terms, as light and accessible as I could. So I thought, what will best convey the interactive complexity of the reading brain. And it occurred to me, it's a circus, like Cirque du Soleil. And so I made uh, an attempt to draw a picture of the brain's interactive nature as a three-ring, actually five-ring circus in which language and perception, cognition, and affect and even motor processing all work together like acts of the circus. And after I hoped I conveyed the beauty of this, I then insisted that the understanding of the reader realizes it's plastic. It doesn't 
necessarily ever become that elaborated, beautiful circus. It can be simple. It can be very elaborated by connecting the processes to the deepest thoughts that we have. And there I introduced the concept, which I did long ago, but it was, I don't think people really quite still understand it. And that's the concept of deep reading. Nicholas Carr and I had an interview before his book, The Shallows. And in that conversation, I used this term deep reading. And he has actually made that term much more accessible to many people. But I look at it in a very cognitive way. Deep reading is that set of interactive processes, which includes the reader's background knowledge, connecting the background knowledge of the reader to the new information, the the sum of that information, if you will, trade off between what's known and what's new, becomes the, the basis for inference, what I call the scientific method processes. Inference, deduction, induction. That in turn, when we have these inferences, which include evaluation, very importantly, do we discern uh, that this is true or false or something in between? That whole process moves into what we call critical analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it gets really both beautifully complex and extremely important for everyone to understand. Critical analysis doesn't always happen. It happens only when we combine all these processes with our our inferences, with our analogies, with what we already know. Mm -hmm. So there is a very important step here. There is a second, even more neglected step in understanding reading, and that's understanding empathy, the role of affect, the role of the reader's ability to leave the self and be transported into another person, another epoch, another perspective. So empathy and perspective taking are part of the most essential aspects of what goes into deep reading. So if I had to have two essential aspects of the reader we have been, the reader I'm worried that will atrophy, and the reader I hope we will become across every medium, it is the combining of our finest abilities to take on the perspective of others, including science perspectives and emotional perspectives, that is the novel and science, if you, if you listen carefully, you're hearing me really say that that reading brain circuit is science and poetry. <laughs> but it's critical analysis and affect meeting. Now, out of that, occasionally, occasionally comes this rare moment of insight by the reader. And that insight can be as generative as something to give the world or as personal and intimate as an understanding of ourselves we've never had before. Now, all of those combine into what I call the deep reading circuit. And that takes you to the middle of the book. The middle of the book poses the question, where has it gone? Mm -hmm. Where deep reading going? And I, I literally have an experiment with myself and I look at how my own reading has changed because of a fundamental concept. The reading brain circuit is plastic. It reflects the writing system and it reflects the medium. If the medium is, in fact, advantaging those cognitive, slower, deep reading processes, that circuit will have that richness. But if the medium like the digital screen, is advantaging faster processing, handling of multiple pieces of information, multitasking, visual imagery, then the circuit reflects those particular processes. The problem, and it's expressed by in many different ways by many different people, is that we are now, as Walter Ong would say, 
we are steeped in two cultures. And the culture of the screen has cognitive costs. It has advantages and it has cost. But the cost, and this is the very heart of the book, is that the deep reading processes are not getting sufficient time because we've become skimmers Mm -hmm. to handle all the information that we are bombarded with, which uh, is supposedly between 50 and 100,000 words a day, not long form, just spasmodically, how, how many words we see a day. We can't but skim. We can't but filter. The problem is that becomes the dominant mode of reading, which bleeds over into all our reading. So I am asking all readers of this book to look at themselves and realize it's not a binary. We are all on the screen. It is not either the digital or the print. It is rather understanding that each of those modes are cognitively and affectively different and it is imperceptible these differences and what we have now is this moment that in neuroscience one always talks platitudinously about use it or lose it in terms of our brain processes well this moment is use it or lose it but better choose it and so what I'm asking people to realize is that their deep reading processes are imperceptibly being affected. Now, they don't necessarily uh, have any awareness of this because we're talking milliseconds until you ask them to think, are you as immersed? Is your writing as complex? Are you able to read the denser materials? Are you retreating to the silos of comfortable information? And if so, do you realize that you are becoming increasingly less analytic and therefore more vulnerable to false information. And here, at the very heart of the book and at the end of the book, I ask the reader to confront the link between how we read, how we think, and how we behave in a democratic society. If critical analysis and empathy are subtly, imperceptibly on the decline. We will be more vulnerable to falsely raised fears by our leaders, falsely raised hopes by everyone around us, and therefore a retreat to our vulnerability to demagoguery and that which is false rather than the discernment of that which is true. And so the book really goes to the middle and at the end at the link between democracy and how we read. In between the middle and the end, and I won't talk about that too much here unless your readers and listeners are interested, I look at the lifespan of a child in this schemata, if you will, of how of my hopes and my worries. And so I begin to propose what I call the development of a biliterate brain for our children, for the next generation. Because, Barry, as you know, my work began and it will end with what we can do for the next generation, for children's development. I'm interested in you and me, Barry, but less interested in what we can do with this knowledge for the for the development of deep reading across any medium. You know, Socrates didn't want us to read, and Plato wrote it all down, and Aristotle became a habitual reader. We know that Socrates was wrong, but he was also right. He was saying our youth will have the illusion of truth when actually they haven't even begun the search for it. Well, I worry that the over-reliance on external platforms of knowledge by our youth will obfuscate the need for them to work hard to get at the truth themselves, to consolidate knowledge themselves so they have the basis for making analogies between what they know and what is new. They can, 
become creatures who don't know what they don't know. And that's a platitude that has a reality that worries me greatly. So that, that if you will, between the middle and the end of this proposal. And then I end, Barry, with the letter that I love because it was, it was, I guess I was channeling Rilke. I was channeling my most tender, my most hopeful thoughts and my most anxious ones. So I use Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I use Bernard Stiegler. I use Marilyn Robinson. I used, I used everyone whom I actually love as, you know, eat some of our lives, some are dead, but these are my friends and I wanted everyone to be introduced or reintroduced to these beautiful minds whom I hope will then take them further. So it was like introduce, I introduce these concepts and I end and say Godspeed because I want them to go further. The reader, now you, you go. What really resonated with me was especially with this experiment you did on yourself, you'd begun to read more to be informed than to uh, to be immersed, much less to be transported. This experiment that you did, and you said how, how difficult it was. Was it the glass bead game by... Um, yes. By Hesse? Yeah. And how, how much you loved that as, a, as a, mm-hmm. an 18 or 19-year-old, but how difficult at first it was to reread that book. But the fact that you in your experience the knowledge of reading deeply in many ways you you reconnected with that but your worry is that uh younger people because they've only been really skimming they've not got that to fall back on right in in a very strange way um the title of the book which originally wasn't going to be my title at all became more clear to me um because it was a matter of deciding that I would go back and persevere and read 20 minutes a day this book that had that had been something I loved and then now it becomes something impossible to enter I persevered and that took both knowledge the what I could how I could read but it also took a great deal of wisdom not wisdom well it was wisdom but but will and I worry that, A, our students don't have the experience of deep reading to return to, and B, there's a certain cognitive impatience that the screen reader um, has within them because they're always hastening to the next thing, the next thing. And so they don't sit, they don't immerse, they don't become transported in the same way that I think that, the beautiful reading experience can be. So when I talk about returning, it was returning to the home inside me that was my reading sanctuary. And the one thing I didn't speak of in that last letter in my, you know, my imperfect overview was that there's this last aspect of the, of deep reading, which is the contemplative. This is the reflective capacity that 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 you know I, I think it's as much a process as a place, a place that we go to. And so I worry excessively that our young neither know that place nor if they know it, have the patience to return to it. So there's two different aspects to my worry. but let me, let me also respond to what you said, Barry, about the novel and its place. In the book, I give two examples that are very important to me. One was what Obama, our former president, said to, I believe, one of our finest novelists, Marilyn Robinson. And he said, it was the novel that taught me moral development. It was the novel that made me understand who others were, that there wasn't about black and white, but, but gray, the, the middle way, actually, Barry, the messy, untidy middle way of humanity. That's what Obama was saying about how 
The novel introduced him to that and never let him forget who others are and their complexity, to which Marilyn Robinson said, the trend towards seeing others as sinister other is the greatest threat to our democracy. And I believe that is true, that when we do not read about others, about how others feel, our stores of empathy are not either replenished or grow. And there's actual research done by people like Keith Oatley and Raymond Marr in Canada who study how stories give us a sense of empathy. And they, they study what's activated in the brain. And so we, we understand that when we read emotionally filled uh, stories, and this is called embodied cognition, because I know you personally are interested in this embodiment principle. Well, in this, in the research on embodied cognition, the more that we are immersed in these stories that, that test, that give us a testing ground for our own emotions, the more empathic we are in our relationships to others outside the books. So there are these studies about not just what the brain is doing when we're reading those books, but also our behaviors, our, our sense of empathy towards others outside in the world. And so the next and last thing I'll say on this is that when we think of the novel as a, 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 a testing ground for emotions and for understanding empathy, we have to really think of what Jane Smiley, another novelist, said um, about the novel. And she said, it's not going to die. It's going to be sidelined, that that's her worry. And if it's sidelined, we will have people who never read, who never understand who others are. And this is this was the ominous moment in that quote. We will then be led by leaders who have no understanding of others which could usher in an era, uh, uh, I think, uh, that would coarsen us and lead us to an era of barbarism. I'm paraphrasing, but the ominousness of it all, that she said this several years before our world erupted into one place after another, having the upsurge of those who see others largely as the ominous enemy. And so many of these people, I believe, are only reading inside the comfortable, non-cognitively challenging silos that affirm their own thought so they don't understand who others are. And I'll bet they don't read any novels yeah. to, to, to lighten this a bit. Yeah, yeah. Just to play devil's advocate here, imagine some people, uh, especially from the younger generation who perhaps get their moral role playing through other arts such as movies for example mm -hmm. so how is the engagement with a um, a really good film perhaps and a novel how is that different in terms of uh, practicing um, ethical behavior i would never pair them or pit them against one another I think there too, there will always be multiple forms in which we can learn about others. I think, however, without saying one is better than the other, it's not about better. It's what does the longer exposure that the novel provides you of entering that perspective of others. I think there's a lasting component. And I, who love films, who love music, who, f I, I just returned yesterday from Saint-Saëns Organ Symphony number no. three. I was absolutely transported. That feeling of being transported by music, that feeling of entering the lives of people I would never know in film. All of these are important. But if we neglect the, if you will, the longer form of perspective taking that a novel gives us over and over again and that we can reread and gather new insights just depending on the maturation of our, of our own lives. I think there is not just a, a special place, 
I believe it's an essential place in the human repertoire of thought and feeling to have books, but especially novels, able to instruct. Now, after saying that, there are differences in individuals, and some individuals really, I believe, receive the same kind of, if you will, transport into other lives through nonfiction, through biography, through history. Yeah. So I do not want to say, oh, if you don't read a novel, you're not an empathic <laughs> person, not at all. But um, as someone who loves both genres, or multiple genres, I think they all have a place. Yeah. But I think an essential place is something that the novel gives us. Sure, no, I agree. Uh, the, another thing, you stress very strongly that you're not a Luddite and that you recognise that digital media has many positive sides to it too. And, and also, it's not going to go away. I think what you're really trying to do is to find a balance. So could you tell us then about the reading world that you would like to envisage? Yes. Um, I mentioned slightly that I have this concept of a biliterate reading brain for our children. And that I, I have no idea whether the practicalities of, of that are possible, but I think something like that would give us um, the ultimate capacity to use deep reading and to have an expansion of what I call the, the 21st century digital skills. So what I'm aiming for for our children is a development of deep reading that begins with print, uh, the sensory motor, the kinesthetic, the concrete uh, concreteness of print, I think is very well suited to the cognitive development and the ways that children think with their bodies in the beginning. So from zero to 10, I envision um, learning to read in print, but using digital for learning to read the important skills of programming and coding that develop these, also develop inferential skills. So there's a lot of cognition that's going on in visual imagery and multitasking in learning how to how to uh, to to deal with several things at once, even though um, I know the research is very clear that when we do multitasking, we're really multitasking at the surface. So when we want to go deeper, we, we need to go back to one task. But nevertheless, multitasking is part of the life of the 21st century um, youth. And so we need to be developing those skills carefully and then we bring them all together um, after the children learn these deep reading skills I want them to be carefully taught to transfer them and here is where the lessons are for all people not just children how do we decide which mode of reading is best for a particular purpose so I want part of the education and the formation of our young and the re return to us who are adults to ask what is the purpose of this reading if it's email skim all you like <laughs> if it is a contract if it is a referendum if it is a beautiful piece of writing please print it out if it is something in between um, like a, an article that we want to know whether we should read, skim if you will, read quickly and then make the decision and then don't think you can just simply read it deeply later, print it out. <laughs> I'm saying this knowing that some people can use deep reading on screen, but you have to be consciously trying to do that. So don't just think it just happens. We are so accustomed, we're so inured to the skimming mode that we are, it bleeds over into everything, even when we think we're deep reading. And the act of printing it out is, I believe, a transitional strategy for our particular moment in time. Until I'm assured that we really can do this at the best level, I think it's a wise thing to slow ourselves down through the concrete geometric quality that print gives us 
because it gives us a spatial dimension to our reading, and it does slow us down imperceptibly enough to allocate time to deep reading. So that's okay. what I think. Great. And um, it's too uh, long an answer. <laughs> no, no, that was great. I'd just like you to um, maybe expand a little bit on another Italo Calvino phrase. Could you tell us a little bit about what you mean by festina lenti? Ah, uh, yeah. So when I talked just just this moment about slowing ourselves down after, you know, skimming, festina lenta means hasten slowly or hurry up slowly. And I look at the whole reading brain as a, a, almost an embodiment of festina lenta, that we have to be absolutely lightning fast so that we can slow down and think. And that's how I think that our world might be best handled, that we we read as quickly as we have to, and then ascertaining the purpose of whatever we're doing, slow ourselves down to really enter that, if you will, that reflective, contemplative function in which we can extract our best thoughts. You know, what... What does it take to do that? And Calvino has many ways of talking about how we need to realize that the act of writing is this incredible process in which the author is attempting to wed his or her best thoughts with the, the, the almost perfect, what you call the mot juste, the almost perfect word, the almost perfect sentence, which cannot be altered, which is, un, I think he said, which is unalterable and memorable. So, I mean, the fact is that most writers can't achieve that, but many writers are attempting to do just that. And when we read the way we're almost all reading, skimming away, we missed two-thirds of the writer's best efforts to render beauty in the written word. So it's Festina Lenta is hurrying so that we can perceive. And that's how I look at the reading brain at its best. Going as fast as we need to, till we enter that home, that sanctuary, that holding ground where we can exert our best thoughts on what we've read. That's beautiful. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying. I'm trying to channel my in- my my inner Calvino. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your understanding of of the Middle Way, Marianne, if any, uh, and how that how might that relate to what we've been talking about today? Well, you know, when when I first read your first email and tried to think, ah, oh, what does this mean? My first association, or the one especially I had this morning, was of Marcus Aurelius <laughs> and his sense of how complex life is and yet how we can choose to ignore that complexity or to enter it. And I look at the middle way as entering the beauty of the complexity and not denying it, but finding our way through it in such a way that we will perceive the beauty of the complexity and not try to diminish it or put it into what I call the neat silos of unchallenging thought. Mm. And that's what we do do not need, and yet what I think has happened as a not unnatural uh, reaction to the glut of information and stimuli that humans in this century are bombarded with. So they have a tendency to want to not simplify in the Henry uh, in the Thoreau Walden sense of simplify, but just divide it into me versus them, what I think, what they think, instead of of entertaining the multiplicity of perspectives. Now it takes no small amount of work, mm-hmm. and I think people 
are, you, you know, they're comfortable not working. And that's not the middle way. The middle way is work. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, a, there are multiple rewards for that work. Just think of the things you would never have encountered or known had you been content or even smugly self-satisfied only with what you knew before you began to entertain the multiple voices, the multiple images, the multiplicity of, of our earth and what lies within its bounds. <laughs> How hopeful are you about the future, Marian? I'm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the middle of it all. I think we all are. I, I liken this moment to what uh, Robert Darnton uh, said about our, our, our transition in communications, where, you know, with Socrates and Plato, we had this absolute moment in which we moved from the beauty of an oral culture into the beauty of a, a, a literacy based one. And now we're in this next great hinge moment between a literate based culture and a digital one. And the hope I have is that unlike other hinge moments, we have the science and the technology that are largely unyoked in my area about reading and the reading brain. And my hope is that we can take the science of our best knowledge about what we would wish to preserve and not lose about the literate culture, what we would wish to preserve and not lose in the digital culture, and find quite, quite clearly the middle way that's inclusive rather than a loss. I do not think we need to lose, but I very much worry, like people like the Parisian philosopher uh, Bernard Stiegler, that we are en route to great losses through the assumed truth value of what people think they are absorbing in their world rather than the absolute increased need for critical analysis and empathy in that world. So I am in the middle uh, between melancholia and hope. <laughs> I think that resonates with me too, very much so. Okay, and my, la my last question, if people wanted to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Well, um, I have a website that my son insisted, my son, who I have two sons who represent two sides of myself, and I'm so proud of both of them. One is an artist, and one works for Google. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, both of them want me to make my web page both, if you will, a representative uh, example of how art and science can come together. So I'm building this. It's MarianneWolf.com. And they, you can begin to see that that's a work in progress. And I hope it will represent both my love of science and the humanities, uh, which go goes a long way to, you know, I, I hope what our future is, where science and the arts can truly come together and technology can be a means, not an end for us. Great. OK. Well, it's been a, an absolute pleasure talking to you today, Marianne. And I absolutely love the book. I found uh, it was both informed and I immerse myself in the book too, and I can't really pay a higher compliment than that for a, for a book, really. So thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you, Barry. I knew this would be a very important conversation, and it was. Thank you so much. You can find out more about Middle Way Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.com dot org